Hello, everybody. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight for this uh, panel discussion of Wong Kar Wai's uh, films. Uh, we're calling this uh, Politics, Gender, and Production History. We have assembled here a really stellar panel of, of six scholars from around the world to discuss Wong Kar Wai's works, um, and I'm going to be introducing them shortly. My name is Adam Graves. I'm the director of the Denver Project for Humanistic Inquiry at MSU Denver, where I'm also a professor of philosophy and teach courses in philosophy of film occasionally when I have the chance. Um, and we're really honored and delighted to be partnering with uh, uh, Denver Film tonight for this event. Uh, Denver Film is hosting uh, The World of Wong Kar Wai, a uh, retrospective of uh, nine films. I think seven of them are, have been recently restored and they're really beautiful. So if you haven't uh, checked that out on their virtual cinema, please do uh, The World of Wong Kar Wai at Denver Film. And when you watch these films, um, you'll, I mean, if, you, if you're familiar with the films and you watch the restorations, it is really actually qu quite impressive uh, how, how beautiful they look uh, and how beautiful they stream. So anyways, so tonight uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna begin by having each of the panelists speak for about five, six minutes. Uh, so that'll be six kind of brief presentations, introducing a theme or a topic or raising some questions. Uh, and then there's going to be an opportunity for those of you who are watching us live to go ahead and uh, pose questions or, or, or comments uh, in the uh, comment box on the side. And uh, we're going to have kind of a more informal conversation. So uh, if you uh, enjoy this conversation, I, I, I welcome you to visit uh, dphi.org. That's uh, D5, the Denver Project for Humanistic Inquiry, the, Humanist, the Humanities Center that I, that I run. Uh, we do regular events on film and, and almost everything else under the sun. So uh, always featuring scholars in the humanities, talking about uh, some interesting topic or a topic that's of kind of broad uh, interest. Uh, so uh, please do check us out. Okay, well, so we're going to begin with uh, Carlos Rojas, who's professor of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, Chinese Cultural Studies, Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies at Duke University. So Carlos, why don't you get the ball rolling for us? Thanks, Adam. Thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this exciting panel. Um, the retrospective actually cycled through Duke um, last month, um, but we didn't have anything this um, sort of outward facing. So I'm very I'm very happy to be part of this, um, this event. The title of my kind of informal presentation today is uh, Propinquity, Contingency, and Intimacy. And I just want to say a few words about several of his films, including most of the films that are part of the retrospective. Um, so here goes. Uh, near the beginning of Wong Kar Wai's 1994 film, Chunking Express, Ta Takeshi Kaneshiro's character, who's known only as Cop 223, brushes past Bridget Lin's character, who um, plays a drug dealer wearing a Marilyn Monroe wig. And he famously remarks that, quote, at our nearest point, I was separated from her by only 0 0.10 centimeters. But 57 hours later, I fell in love with this woman. This relationship between per propinquity, contingency, and intimacy, intimate relationships grounded on accidental moments of near contact, like ships passing in the night, is a key theme, not only in Chunking Express, but also it's a key theme of Wong Kar Wai's entire cinematic oeuvre. In Chunking Express, for instance, this in imprecation of propinquity, contingency, and intimacy characterizes not only COP 223's quasi-romance with the Marilyn Monroe drug dealer um, in the first half of the film, but also the relationship in the second half of the film between COP 663, played by Tony Leung Cho Wai, and a Midnight Express snack bar worker, played by Fei Wang. In addition, the film itself is composed of two virtually independent halves that suggestively abut onto one another like two ships passing in the night. The entire Chunking Express movie, meanwhile, was produced on the fly during the long delayed production of Wong Kar Wai's deeply melancholic and philosophical martial arts epic, a Ashes of Time. During a short break in the editing of this long delayed um, film, um, uh, which was ultimately released later in 1994, Wong shot and released, shot and edited Chunking Express in only three months. Um, Moreover, in addition to the two plot lines that make up the two halves of Chunking Express, there's actually a third plot line involving a disillusioned hitman played by Leon Lai and his agent played by Michelle Reese, who is infatuated, infatuated with him, although she almost never sees him in person. 
this third plot line did not ultimately make it into Chunking Express, but was incorporated into the film's much darker quasi-sequel, Fallen Angels, which was released the following year in 1995. Accordingly, as films, Ashes of Time, Chunking Express, and Fallen Angels, all released in 1994-1995, suggestively abut onto one another, like ships passing in the night. Filmed and released in 1997, meanwhile, Happy Together is set in Buenos Aires, and Wang, Wang, Wang Karwai has noted that, quote, one of the reasons I, he, chose Argentina was that it is on the other side of the world. And I thought that by going there, I'd be able to stay away from 1997. This, of course, being the year of the Hong Kong handover, which is a very tumultuous moment um, for um, residents of Hong Kong. The, co the quote continues. But then, as you must understand, once you consciously try to stay away from something or to forget something, you will never succeed. That something is bound to be hanging in the air, haunting you, end quote. In other words, Happy Together and the Hong Kong handover, both from 1997, suggestively abut onto one another, like ships passing in the night. Wong Kar Wai's first collaboration with his longtime cinematographer, Christopher Doyle, was the 1990 film Days of, um, Days of Being Wild, which was also the first installment in an informal trilogy that ultimately spanned nearly 15 years, with the second film being In the Mood for Love, 1990, and culminating with the film 2046, released in 2004. Um, set in the 1960s, these films revol revolved, like many of Wong's other works, around themes of desire, yearning, loss, and mediated recuperation. In many of the preceding film, if many of the preceding films will be familiar to Wong Kar fa fans, the final film in this retrospective, The Hand, is perhaps somewhat less well known, particularly in the extended director's cut version that is being shown as part of this retrospective. Originally filmed for the 2004 omnibus film titled Eros, which in addition to Wong's short film also included contributions by Steven Soderbergh and Michelangelo Antonioni, The Hand opens with an encounter between a 1960s Hong Kong, um, I guess, socialite, um, for want of a better word, played by Gong Li, and her longtime tailor, uh, played by Zhang Jin. Um, in the sequence that both opens and closes the film, um, Zhang Jin asks uh, the Gong Li character how she's feeling today. And she, who at this moment is ill, perhaps from TV, it's unclear, replies that she is feeling okay, but adds that he shouldn't return again because, as she says in Mandarin Chinese, hui uh, meaning that she could be contagious. Um, the film covers a long-time relationship of unrequited and effectively unrequitable desire, but it is this encounter in the film's diegetic present with which the film begins and ends that comments most directly on our own present condition, um, which has also contributed to the nature of this present um, forum, um, which is that of two individuals craving intimacy yet haunted by the threat of contagion, yearning for one another, yet passing like two ships in the night. Um, thank you very much. That's going to happen a lot. Sorry, uh, I've had my my uh, mic on mute. Thank you very much, Carlos. I really appreciate that uh, really nice presentation. I should say, I'm sure we're going to have a variety of presentation styles. So if, if the other panelists, if you didn't if you didn't uh, prepare like actual written remarks, that's totally fine. I didn't expect anyone to, but that was really nice um, and a really nice way to kind of a, a nice jumping off point too, since you covered and discussed uh, the connections between some of these films, at least in their the production and how that also connects to the to the kind of the content and 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 uh, Wong Kar Wai's kind of narrative style. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> Our next speaker is Gina Marchetti, a professor of film, gender, and sexuality, uh, critical theory, and cultural studies, uh, director of the Center for the Study of Globalization and Cultures at, Hong, at the University of Hong Kong. So uh, Gina, take it from here. Thank you. And I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint to share with people uh, so that I can have some uh, visual uh, cues for you as you're watching this retrospective. And I'm going to concentrate on the, on the trilogy that Carlos just mentioned, uh, which I will loosely call the Shanghai Trilogy. None of these films are sh set in Shanghai, but they're all about Shanghai people displaced and living in Hong Kong, very much like Wong Kar Wai himself, who was born in Shanghai, 
but spent his childhood and his adult years, obviously, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of this displacement was due to political factors, obviously, even before 1949 with the establishment of the People's Republic, there were people who, who were moving into Hong Kong to escape um, uh, Japanese occupation, civil war, et cetera. But it was really after 1949 when there was a huge influx of intellectuals, uh, writers, uh, filmmakers, uh, you know, uh, designers of various kinds. And, uh, and, and Walker White often gets his inspiration from people uh, like Louis Chang, who uh, inspired uh, not not too directly, but indirectly uh, in the mood for love, which is one of the films in the trilogy I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Wong Kar Wai also makes use of many actors and actresses with Shanghai connections, and probably the one that will stand out to you if you see all three films and kind of see them together and look at them as a set, even though they are year were made years apart. Uh, Rebecca Pan is in both Days of Being Wild, where she has a, a really prominent role, as well as in In the Mood for Love. So if you look at this kind of character, you get a feeling for the type of woman that Wong Kar Wai associates with the exile community of his youth. Who were these people like and what were the women in particular like? And that's what I'm going to focus on today. Now, uh, in that film, Days of Being Wild, uh, you see Rebecca Pan play a character who is fading, an older woman, an older courtesan who is fading. And her charge is um, Yadi, played by Leslie Jung. And you see her presented that way as this kind of fading flower, as she is, uh, you know, a drunken uh, courtesan, you know, in her, in her final days. Now, I want to also emphasize the fact that you see a particular style. Many people, when they ask me about Wong Kar Wai, they wonder about, you know, well, what, are, what, are the, what is that style? The women are wearing that, uh, the dress, the chi pao. And the chi pao is a garment that is, uh, looks old fashioned sometimes to people outside of Asia, but actually was a sign of modernity in the early 20th century for women and that it was very much associated with Shanghai, with something known as Shanghai style, with a type of uh, dress, demeanor, uh, uh, music, et cetera, that was associated with it. Now, Carlos mentioned the hand. The hand is about a woman's intimate relationship with her tailor. The chi pao, this kind of uh, uh, garment, is something that really sets the Shanghai woman apart. So even when she uh, is displaced into Hong Kong. She continues to wear this type of dress, which indicates both her style and also her status. So class is an element of this as well. Only rather wealthy women could, could afford a chi pao, like, uh, and the number of chi pao's that uh, Maggie Jung wears in In the Mood for Love. Now she plays a character called Suli Jun in all three films. So, but the Suli Jun in Days of Being Wild is very different from the Suli Jun in In the Mood for Love. And whether they're meant to be the same character or a version of the same character, I doubt it. I think that the name seems to resonate for Wong Kar Wai and it resonates across these women, but it does indicate a certain kind of connection. When we look at In the Mood for Love in particular, that's where you really see the Shanghai community in detail. You see the kitchen, the food, the dress. You see, you listen to the music. And once again, Rebecca Pan was also a singer. You hear her on, uh, on the soundtrack, as well as see her as the landlady in the film. You also have these uh, uh, elements, these connections to older Shanghai films like Street Angel. Once again, through the name of the film, which is in Chinese, a version of this song's title as well as hearing the song uh, at one point in the film. The Shanghai society you see is literally claustrophobic and contained. You can see the way that the, uh, uh, the, the shots are designed to close in these characters, to close in these women, and that this is a world in which uh, the Suli Jun character is often on the sidelines. She's often left out of what's going on, both by her own choice as well as by the way the community operates because she is a source of gossip. When you, she discovers that 
her, her husband is having an affair with her neighbor's wife, etc. They begin, how do they work through it? They work through it by playing each other's part. So you see this element of theatricality that comes into play in In the Mood for Love that's also associated with this Shanghai style. Appearance is very important. Uh, even if you live in a crowded apartment, you're, you're cramped in there, how do you express yourself? How do you express your wealth? Through your clothes, through your demeanor, through what you can eat, what you can afford, uh, eating Western food, etc. cetera. Uh, as I mentioned too, of course, she's an object of gossip. You know, who dresses up like that just to go to get noodles at night? This idea of her clothing makes her, the way she looks makes her an object of gossip, as well as the fact that she is on her own. The husband is often traveling for business. This kind of community is an insular community. Uh, you also see the servants, even though they live in cramped quarters, they brought with them servants from Shanghai. Uh, just a side note that the woman who plays the ama in, uh, uh, in the mood for love is actually Sammo Hung's grandma. And she herself was a, a, a very well-known Shanghai actress in, in the back in the day. Entrapment. Okay. The feeling that they are trapped in Hong Kong, that they are trapped in relationships that are not working. They are trapped physically and visually. Keep that in mind. The chi pao also gives you a sense of being contained, the neckline, etc. So keep that in mind. Everything from the dress to the way in which the shots are composed gives you that feeling throughout the film. Also, as a woman, uh, Suli Jun is an object of gossip in a way the men are not. And she, of course, is scolded by her landlady, uh, once again, Rebecca uh, Pan, who plays a very different kind of character than she does in um, Days of Being Wild. So keep that in mind as you watch the film. Keep in mind, too, the political elements of this, the overlap that Carlos mentioned between politics and the, the romance in the film. Uh, room 2046, of course, is where the couple uh, uh, retreats, uh, maybe to have an affair, maybe not, ostensibly to write a martial arts book. And then in 2046, the last film, you barely see Maggie Jung in that film, but you have another Suli Jun. So you have this split character, uh, one played by Gong Li, one played by Maggie Jung, all in flashback. So when you see this flashback, you get this feeling of uh, memory that is popping in. But also in the, in the case of Wong Kar Wai's career, you get this the, the impression that he's returning to, to his past successes and to the past where he is contemplating this uh, Shanghai community in Hong Kong that is gradually, of course, fading away. Now, thank you for your attention. I just wanted to wish you all a very happy Year of the Ox, which starts today here in Hong Kong. And uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, reading more about the remarks I've made today, uh, we can put this into the comments later. Here's some writings that I've done on this trilogy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gina. Really appreciate the presentation. And you're so chipper, but of course it's morning for you. So oh yes, <laughs> evening for us. So great, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Karen Fong. A uh, professor in the Department of English, chair of the Initiative in Media and the Moving Image at uh, the University of Houston. Take it away, Karen. Oh, you're but you're you're muted though. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> thank you for catching that before I got too, too far along. And, and thank you for Gina for the wishes for um, the year of the ox because it's actually my year. So I, that, I feel, um, feel particularly welcome. Um, and I'm so pleased to be following on Carlos and Gina because um, I'm interested in the same things that they're talking about, but uh, getting at it at a different angle. Um, so I'm particularly interested, you know, I think for those of us who know Wang Kar Wai or maybe for, for the people who are about to watch him for the first time, the thing that everybody remarks about Wong Kar Wai films is this incredibly romantic quality to his films that is unlike you know, almost anything else that you can see in global cinema and certainly in Hong Kong film for people who know Hong Kong film or, or maybe have an association of what they think Hong Kong film might be. And so, so what is it that, that, that signature Wong Kar Wai style, right? I mean, for the, again, if you know something about his production style, it's all, 
usually in collaboration with a number of people. Um, Carlos mentioned Christopher Doyle, the cinematographer. There's also his um, production artist, William Chang Chang Sat Ping, and also very importantly, um, Patrick Tam, the film editor who works with him and had worked with him in other times, is also very important. Um, so Wong Kar Wai's films, they're often kind of elliptic. They're not linear, right? There's, um, there's a, a sort of um, a very sort of high contrast color thing. You can see that in my virtual background, which is a screenshot from Chunking Express, there's um, time is out of step. Again, you can see captured in the image behind me. At the same time that the, um, the dialogue focuses on time on a particular way and intensity. I mean, Carlos mentioned the way that you know, the characters constantly meet, like we're meeting again, remember me at this time, or the re recurrence of the room that Gina mentioned, room 2046. Um, so there's this constant, you know, this, this desire to push things and to make things, to render things a little bit abstract at the same time it reinforces a certain kind of attention to certain things. And so the same thing visually what we get in Wong Kar Wai a lot of times as Gina pointed out is this Ten tendency to see people within framed by other contacts. So through, through keyhole shots, through windows, through bars, the sort of scenes of entrapment that Gina was talking about as well, right? So there's this kind of sense of like what, what Carlos was calling contingency, what Gina was calling um, entrapment is this, like this, this feeling of life under a glass. And what I think is really interesting about Wang Kar Wai, and I think what people pick up on, even if they're not thinking about it necessarily because a lot of what Wong Kar Wai does is is latent and intuitive rather than um, intentional and explicit because of course again many of you may know that and I, Carla spoke about this as well that that Wong Kar Wai is famously notoriously somebody who does a lot in post-production he doesn't have much of a, enough of a script right he he comes to the set with like new ideas you know throws out what the lines that his actors learned right so there's there's always an improvisational quality to the films and yet somehow they turn out to be these amazing films so, so what is it what is it that that what is the thing that ties what seems so inventive together and one of the thing that like I think is a recurring thing in Wong Kar Wai's films, and I would really encourage people to look at as they go through this retrospective, is the erotics of voyeurism and surveillance. So like what Gina was talking about, fame, most people come to this through In the Mood for Love, but it's in there from his very first films, from As Tears Go By, Days of Being Wild, and famously, particularly, as Carlos was talking about in Chunking Express and Fallen Angel, where, I mean, you literally have Michelle Reese's character masturbating, you know, <laughs> to like the her the her play her in, invasion of of, of the um, of the apartment of the person that she's interested. in. Chunking Express does it more whimsically, right, with Faye Young sort of penetrating um, and transforming the uh, apartment of the cop that she's interested in. And if you think about just the recurrence of police characters through Wong's films, right, and so Gina had the image of the Andy, um, Andy Lau, like um, being in the background is, you know, wearing the, the lucky, the traditional green police uniform. And remember, they always met by the police box. Like, and so the police box was this, this, this artifact of, of, of the Hong Kong landscape before they had, you know, radios. Like this was a way to check in to, for the Hong Kong police to register their regular beat. So there's this, so what's fascinating about Wong Kar Wai's films is not only like that, there's this kind of like, um, apparatus of the police procedural, like the focus on time, the police characters, the recognition of space and the contingency of characters in space. And yet for Wong Kar Wai, his, his interest is completely romantic, right? And so again, in Chunking Express, as Carlos pointed out, you have the other story of the uh, Takeshi Kaneshiro char character with his sort of misconnection. He's a cop who coincidentally collides, literally collides with a woman who should be a suspect for murder. And yet the storyline has no interest in that. In Wong's interest, it only goes the possibility of romance, right? And so this, um, I think this is one of Wong's signature moves in, throughout all of his films, one of his, his sort of characteristic um, themes and st stylistic gestures. And what's particularly interesting when we sort of step back from Wong and put him in the landscape of Hong Kong film is the way in which Wong's interest in the erotics of surveillance and voyeurism is simultaneously both idiosyncratic to him, particular to him, and also a variation 
on a recurring theme in Hong Kong cinema. And I won't use up our time here today to talk about this, but um, I've, I've written a book on called Arresting Cinema, Surveillance in Hong Kong Film. And what, what I talk about in there is the, this um, importance of surveillance in Hong Kong cinema throughout its, its history from the 1950s as a way for Hong Kong film to engage with global cinema, which you know, from the beginning, from uh, Man with a Movie Camera, moder Modern Times, from The Great Train Robbery, has used surveillance as a way to explore this new medium. And that for Hong Kong cinema to use surveillance as simultaneously both a way for Hong Kong, Hong Kong cinema to position itself in relationship to global film, but also to explore the ways in which a densely crowded place like Hong Kong, again, you can see in my virtual background, is full of contingency. And that contingency doesn't always have to be an intrusion on privacy, but can sometimes be, you know, fruitful, often in romantic ways. And, and I think that what Wong Kar Wai does is tease that out in a visually spectacular way. Thank you very much, Karen. Really appreciate that. That's fascinating, especially under the uh, uh, current kind of political circumstances in, in Hong Kong. I'd like to talk more about that um, perhaps during the discussion. Um, so our next speaker is Joe Mac uh, sorry, Joe McElaney, who is a professor of theater and performance at Hunter College, the City University of New York. Thank you, uh, thank, yeah, thank you, Adam. Uh, given that we're here tonight um, in relation to a Wong Kar Wai retrospective, I thought it might be of some interest to address how Wong's films have come to us in multiple versions. There are, for example, at least three different cuts of The Grand Master. There is Ashes of Time and Ashes of Time Redux. Janus Films is now distributing remasters of some Wong films, and these are, these are the ones being shown for the Denver Film Society series. And these titles will soon be released on Blu-ray and DVD by Criterion. A longer version of The Hand is included in the series uh, and in the set. A slightly shorter version, apparently, of Happy Together. But also, the look of most of the films is different from, from what we've been seeing for many years now. The credits have been redesigned. Fallen Angels is now cropped in order to look like Cinemascope. The colors of In the Mood for Love now appear to be dominated by a more fashionable green. Now, I have no opinion on these remasterings as I haven't seen any of them from beginning to end yet, aside from the hand. But the descriptions and the single viewing I've had of this new, longer version of the hand indicate that they're being less restored than, in some cases, reimagined. Now, there's certainly nothing new about artists revising their work years after its initial appearance. This has been going on for centuries. And we are all familiar, I think, with second guessing on the part of filmmakers, their inability to leave well enough alone. Chaplin did it on some of his major films. In recent years, Francis Coppola has virtually made a career out of it. Michael Mann and William Friedkin frequently tinker with their films decades after their release. And of course, there's the example of George Lucas forever updating his Star Wars productions for later generations while repressing their first incarnations. Now, one could read some of this as a cynical attempt to keep the films as contemporary and marketable as possible, thereby avoiding the stigma of the embalmed classic. With these remasterings, Wong will no doubt be accused of this kind of cynicism. It's already anecdotally occurring on social media even if it, as it's likely that the revised versions will generate more capital than had the films undergone conventional restorations. The anger towards revisions of this nature has to do with the attachment viewers have to the original films. So the revisions amount to an historical desecration, an insidious rewriting of the past. The films cease to belong to the spectator, but revert to their creator who now has other ideas. Wong's films, so often structured upon repetition, obsession, and ritual, have long generated a feverish cult-like devotion. The films are likewise experienced ritualistically, repetitively. Tampering with the film, then, is like tampering with an idol. However, I want to suggest that what Wong is engaging in with these alternate versions, whatever one thinks of them, is closely aligned with the form and sensibility of the films themselves. His productions are well-known, and uh, Karen has just referred to some of them. Um, the shooting is typically quite protracted. The films 
will assume a form very different from what was evident in the screenplay, while the editing involves another rethinking of the material, always this becoming, the creative process ongoing. Culmination is always delayed, deferred. Wong's justification for the most recent changes he has made is a standard one. This is what he has always wanted the films to be, and now at last he has the opportunity to rectify prior errors and interferences. Regardless of whether one completely believes this claim in relation to the changes made on every film or not, the desire to go back into one's past and change things is central to Wong. The cinema, so steeped in romantic irony, is constantly infected by a desire to become something else, something better, to fight against the ravages of time and the upheavals of history, even as the films equally point to the impossibility of this. In the hand, Zhang the tailor does not simply make dresses for the woman he loves, but is eventually forced to make alterations in them because his object of desire is ill and wasting away. Might we not see then Zhang's situation as a metaphor for the ultimate attraction and futility of this need of Wong's to fight against the inevitability of things coming to an end. Now it's argued in mind will not calm the anxieties of those attached to the originals. It could however lead the devotees to likewise undergo their own transformations to re-examine and clarify the nature if not the history of their own relationship to the original fascinations these deeply romantic films once held over them. As Wong has somewhat defensively stated in relation to the new versions, these are not the same films and we are not the same audience. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Really appreciate that. That's interesting, especially someone like myself who doesn't know uh, Wong Kar Wai's film so well enough to notice those differences. I'm gonna keep an eye out for them uh, as I continue watching. Um, so next up is Ken Preventure who's professor of film and media, uh, sorry, professor of film and media history and analysis, world cinema, Japanese cinema, the Hollywood industry, and the video essay at uh, University of California, Irvine. So Ken, take, us, take it away. All right, well, thanks, Adam. So with my, with my opening remarks, I just wanted to raise a question more than do a presentation, but the question has to do with the appeal of Wong Kar Wai across the world, the transnational or international appeal of Wong. And it, it is related to a broader question of why certain filmmakers travel, like why this filmmaker and not other filmmakers. And there is a way you can look at Wong Kar Wai and how it happened, like some success at the Cannes Film Festival with Happy Together and, and then distribution deals with companies in the US and Europe and then co-productions like The Hand was mentioned. Uh, and, uh, but that still doesn't account really for the appeal and then the ongoing relevance of Wong Kar Wai, even as much more time seems to elapse between movies of, of Wong's, his work is still relevant. And, and by that, I mean, even just today, I was recording an introduction to Chungking Express, which I'm showing in a class tomorrow by pure coincidence. And when I taught this same class, which is a general intro, intro to film class last semester, I asked the students, what film made the most impression, the biggest impression on you? And everyone said Chunking Express. And I, they weren't being nice. I think, they, I think they really did make a, that movie still grabs audiences, young audiences in particular. And, and I think it's worth raising the question why that might be. And, and I don't think it's as simple as something like genre that Wong Kar Wai is, is following the genre tropes of global Hollywood. Certainly not, that's not the case. And I don't think it's something like some of the iconography that's used in movies, like using uh, music, uh, American pop music or tango music, or you have like, like the McDonald's logo in Fallen Angels and Chunky Express. I don't think that's why there's that connection. Uh, I see the appeal really in the design of the characters. And I think the phrase world of Wong Kar Wai is really appropriate because, because we, it is a world. We're taken different places, different times. Uh, but there is a coherence there, and I think it has to do with the characters who are consistently designed as being escapist or romantic, as has already been mentioned, where you're just seeing the same sorts of characters. They all have the same attitude, which is looking for a way out, looking for something else or someone else. And more than that, though, they deliberately put themselves in places where they 
now are accessible or open to these random encounters, like like what people were saying earlier, these these accidental encounters. This isn't something I think imposed on them uh, by the outside. I think it's something they deliberately, uh, a situation they deliberately welcome or invite in the way they choose their occupation in the way they choose how they do their jobs. Like they have jobs, but are they really trying to advance in their careers? Do they have that kind of ambition? Uh, no, they really are looking for something else. And I, and I think that kind of appeal, that, that romantic character is one that I think uh, is connecting all the films and I think has that connection to audiences transnationally. And, uh, and, and I now just hearing Joe's presentation about the different versions, it seems like even Juan Kar Wai is trying to escape even his own films at times, trying to run. There's always a better version, it seems, for, for Wong. We're never satisfied, right? So, uh, so that's a question I wanted to raise about the appeal of Wong Kar Wai and, uh, and along with the characteristics of his filmmaking. Great, thank you, Joe. We'll, uh, maybe we'll kick off the conversation by returning to that question. It is a good one. Um, and uh, uh, it doesn't surprise me at all uh, that 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 film in particular is you know is is rated highly among students today um but why it's a good question uh so okay last but not least is uh thorsten Bots bornstein who is a professor of philosophy at gulf university in kuwait so yeah hello okay yeah thank you uh yeah you, you might see the sunrise behind me um while i'm talking so um I want to talk about time, and uh, many people, um, three or four, uh, mentioned time nostalgia, time is out of step. Uh, maybe I will give a more abstract, uh, because as, as a philosopher, I give a more abstract summary of this idea of time that we have in Wong Kar Wai. Um, much has been written about it. Uh, some people said that there is a metaphysical sense of time at work. There is this uh, stretching, delating, dragging, speeding, speeding up of time. Uh, there are many watches, clocks, calendars uh, in the films, and um, <clears throat> the people talk about the past, the present, the future. So time is visited as a both uh, objective and subjective phenomenon. Um, now, um, somebody said it's a nostalgic sentiment, sentimentalism, so that's what I want to uh, pick up. Um, um, time has um, existential connotations because uh, nostalgia is not necessarily only the straightforward sentimental longing for the past. Uh, if, if that would be the case, then uh, nostalgia would uh, stop, always stop once we have reached the past, uh, that can happen. It happens, for example, in, in theme parks, but uh, that is not the only uh, way nostalgia can appear. So I uh, uh, want to distinguish between fulfilled and sustained nostalgia. Um, <clears throat> the, the first one can really, can indeed become sentimentality when the past becomes present and the desire for the past has been satisfied, uh, then the past becomes here and now, and we have that in theme parks, I said that, but um, uh, nos uh, sustained nostalgia never ends. It's a nostalgic awareness of time that is um, best attained when time is not permitted to flow in a straightforward fashion but when it proceeds towards uh, along more twisted and tortuous lines. So sustained nostalgia is the opposite of progression that we would normally attribute to time. Uh, the nostalgic longing for the past is not uh, conservative regressing, but it interrupts the time flow by concentrating on details, for example. Uh, very important there is contemplation, which is a very philosophical notion. Um, uh, so uh, uh, when we are in a state of sustained nostalgia, time is not flowing, but it stumbles, it falters, it hesitates, and it invites us to contemplate. So I think that Wong Kar Wai, he creates a temporal universe 
where the belief in temporal progression is shattered. Uh, somebody said in the mood for love, uh, the, um, the images do not narrate, but they linger, they describe, they emote. There's a temporal standstill produced through nostalgic images. Uh, the nostalgia is contained in these lingering images that do not necessarily uh, refer us to a certain past or a certain meaning. There is not necessarily a, a manifest context, content that it refers to, but it, refer, it uh, appears more uh, like something self-reflexive. Um, uh, the privilege of the detail over the whole, for example, uh, would be something like that. It's not a detail that refers to something else, but it stands for, uh, for a whole. So nostalgia is produced by manipulating temporal temporality, uh, and the relations to the, to the past are altered. Uh, this nostalgia does not simply recollect the objects that we lost in the past, but it appears more like a loop, like a, a recycling of images. So the result is the cultivation of individual of an individual emotion that is independent of metaphorical connections between a present signifier and uh, a signified past. Uh, so um, um, in uh, Days of Being Wild, uh, the first six minutes for me, it's uh, extremely interesting. Uh, I said that contemplation is necessary, but how can time, uh, which normally is uh, flowing, how can it be uh, contemplated? Well, I would say um, uh, time needs to be packaged, it needs to be wrapped uh, in what? Uh, in time. So when I look at the first six minutes of Days of Being Wild, it's Yudi's first encounter with Solai Chun in the cafeteria where she's selling sodas. There is the dramatically clicking, uh, ticking clock, uh, appears from the second shot onward, when there is an allusion to the inevitable progress of mathematically calculated time. Then there are Yudi's loudly echoing footsteps on the concrete floor in the empty cafe that leads him, uh, lends him some authenticity as the master of time. Uh, he is in sync with the clocks ticking, uh, but uh, also competing with it. Uh, then uh, Yudi shows us that whoever wants to resist the logic of temporal flow must create a time capsule um, uh, that is then uh, that can be consumed in the future. Uh, in other words, time must be reproduced in time. So uh, uh, it is not enough just to refer back to the past and to hide this within some nostalgic idyllic space, uh, nor is it enough to move ahead of time, for example, by dreaming about a better future. But the straightforward fleeing of time, backward or forward, does not stop time, because time will catch up with you anyway. So uh, Yudi does not announce at the end of this first encounter with Solai Chun that he will return to the same cafe in the future. Uh, instead, he says, you will see me tonight in your dream. Now, that prediction is not a dreamlike projection of the future. It is not what Freud would have called a, a Wunschtraum, uh, uh, but uh, it's a future dream containing in itself a certain detail of the past. Uh, in other words, in this dream, the present will be relived in the future, not as a restaging of the past, but rather as an autonomous fragment animated by dream time, which might contain the past. So when they do meet the next day, the clock is ticking, um, in, before they speak, and then she complains that she did not see him in her dream, but he re reassures her that he, she will see him in the future. So once again, a, a future is postponed and the nostalgia is sustained. Thank you. There you go. I guess I never learned. Thank you, Thorsten. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate you, speaking of time, uh, getting up uh, at the crack of dawn or or before the crack of dawn, I should say, to uh, join us tonight. That's uh, really kind of you. 
Um, yeah, you know, in, in in days of being wild, I also remember I I had a, a question about you know I was curious what people thought about um, this. I, I feel like cleaning objects is a recurring theme in in these films. I I think I can't think of one that I've seen that where there isn't someone who who you know scrubs a a, a clock for. Uh, you know, the same exact p- place of the clock, you know, the one side of the clock for f- what feels like an eternity. In fact, I think that is in days of being wild, um, which of course clocks are pretty central. Or t- like you mentioned, time is pretty central, but I was curious if, you know, what what w- you make of of that as, as a whole, if anyone has any thoughts on that subject, this idea of just kind of w- repetitive washing, it just seems to be an activity that his characters engage in quite a lot, especially considering they're not always in the cleanest environments, right? I mean, a lot of, there are a lot of gritty uh, back alleys and, you know, um, back the kind of, what do you call it? The back, the back end of a restaurant uh, in his films. I, I could chime in maybe a little bit on that because uh, uh, Wakar Wai is obsessed with commodities and he's obsessed with things. So his films are very physical, not just clothing, but as you say, clocks, rice cookers, bags, ties. The characters are very much, very materialistic in many ways. And that's what gives a lot of his films flavor. So commodities that circulate like drugs in Chungking Express or commodities that are being replaced in Chungking Express, the the rice cooker in, in The Mood for Love, all of these objects are things that are uh, part and parcel of his universe of that world. And that world is very much a world in which th- there is a, uh, a tension between the surface and depth, between the most superficial thing that you're cleaning all the time, and then the depths of that, the philosophical depths of time. So there's that sense of time is an object, is a clock that you can give to somebody. It's a, uh, a, an object on the wall, and then it's also part of your soul. Right. So that tension is always there. And then also Wong Kar Wai is very much aware of uh, Hong Kong as a place where objects come and go, where people come and go, where there are these flows that are part of a part and parcel of Hong Kong's ephemeral nature in many ways, you know, where Hong Kong has always been between Britain and mainland China, you know, this kind of meeting place in the world, the world's marketplace that you see in Chunky Express, where everything can be bought and sold and traded, where you've got music from around the world, where you've got drugs from around the world, where you've got uh, food, you know, at the Midnight Express from around the world, all of this kind of meeting place of this stuff that Wong Kar Wai is very much obsessed with, the material and then the ephemeral. Of course, for Americans, uh, people, at least of, of my generation, remember all the toys that we had as kids, you know, yes. everything had the Hong Kong uh, stamp, every, every, you know, Hot Wheel car that I ever had as a kid or, or action figure uh, seemed to be manufactured in Hong Kong. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that Wong Kar Wai is uh, conscious of. I mean, probably he not is, much. I can imagine that, you know, it's like Trenton, New Jersey, you know, there's the big sign across, across the river that says Trenton makes and the world takes. You know, I'm thinking to myself, no, no, that's Hong Kong, my friend. You know, Trent is, you know, um, but yeah, and then I was thinking happy and happy together. I think, uh, I forgive me, I don't know the names of the characters, but the, the basically the two main characters, one gives the other a watch and then, and then later needs it back, right? Um, and so there's the kind of giving and taking, giving and receiving of, of time. Um, let's return to Ken's question about the kind of enduring popularity of, of especially, I think, Chungking Express, among uh, our you know students, college age students, kids in their late teens and early twenties, um, I know Ken, you have you you obviously you pose the question, but you have some pretty concrete thoughts about what what uh, what can account for that. Um, my you know my initial thought was that that film does use music in a way that's really incredible, and but it's not music that I think most kids. Well, I know for a fact most of my students wouldn't know, um, you know, what a difference a day makes. Uh, that would be a song that they've maybe heard in the background, but now they see this film and it kind of somehow um, it it lives in a way in that in that in that film. Uh, you know, you could hear the you could hear the song a hundred times and maybe not be struck by it, but somehow 
um, it just it just really really hits you. Maybe that's something we should talk about. The, the, his use of 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 music, um, and because I think he must be. I mean, I know there are other you know thinking of Hollywood. Quentin Tarantino is a director who you know is famous for you know thinking about scenes in terms of the music that um, that he's selected for it. Maybe even before he's written it. I wonder if Wong Kar Wai does that. Does he begin with an idea? Of, of a song that he wants to use and then and then kind of write the scene kind of more or less spontaneously or um, I also get the sense that characters have songs almost like operas or Star Wars you know where there'll be a theme a, a song that will repeat in conjunction with a character and then sometimes it'll flip and all of a sudden the song will be maybe owned by a different character but any comments on on music in Wong Kar Wai? Well just picking up your note about Chunking Express you you have not only in that movie a singer playing a character who is obsessed with an American pop song, but you also have a music video in that movie of the singer, the actual singer performing a song by the Cranberries oh, that yeah. then becomes so appealing to someone like Quentin Tarantino, who then gets the movie distributed on video, which then results. So there's this like, you can almost say these signs do catch on and create this network of interest but it does reflect back on the movie itself as well what is the point of this song and getting to Gina's point about that it's a it's a repetitive it, it's something it's just part of life which is something you can own and make it yours to the point where you can actually have the performer listen to a song and then perform it's yeah uh, but there's all, all kinds of other ways to talk about music besides that. There's, there's music theft in that movie, which is unusual, right? Because is it the mamas and the papas? All the leaves are brown and the sky is gray. California, California dreaming. dreaming. Yeah. California yeah. dreaming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. California, California dreaming. dreaming. Yeah, that's and 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 how she brings the CD to the to the man's apartment yeah. and then forgets it and then he claims that it's actually his ex girlfriend's uh, and so there's like song theft, which. That doesn't happen very often in, in, in film or and, possibly in life. And just, just one more note about this, talk about coincidence. So the class I taught last semester, the film we watched after Chunking Express was Run, Lola, Run, by total coincidence, also use what a difference a day makes in that first episode when the two of them die in their first attempt at, at stealing the money. And uh, that has to be a total takeoff from Chunking Express, right? It can't be anything else. I yeah, think coming, I think coming back to this question, though, as to why the original question here, which is why young students seem to be responding still to Wong Kar Wai's films, because I've been showing different Wong films for over 20 years now, and I haven't seen a shift in even though the films seemed when they emerged to be quite fashionable and perhaps even the kinds of films that would perhaps date very quickly. That hasn't happened in my experience, uh, but I think specific music choices, the fact that the songs might not be out of their own particular histories, doesn't really matter. Um, I think it simply has more to do with the choice of music in relation to image and in relation to montage and the entire atmosphere that those songs create. The Wong film I show most often in courses is in, is in the mood for love, which I teach virtually every year. Uh, and of course the music there, Nat King Cole singing in Spanish and, and so on. And, and then the Chinese pop music that we also hear. Uh, they don't know any of this. Uh, they might know, some of them might know who Nat Nan King Cole was, but it doesn't matter. Uh, there's the general instinctive, intuitive response just to the beauty of what things look and sound like, the texture of things. And then uh, Wong films are always, I think, puzzles uh, as well. And there's something always to dive into for them. And that's always particularly striking, including things like, okay, why, is, why do we hear Nat King Cole singing Green Eyes in Spanish? three or four times in the film and invariably in relation to the same kind of beating situation between the two leads and so on. And what does this tell us as he's singing green eyes or we're looking at green cups, green saucers and green plates on the table and so on. Uh, what is what is all of this about? Then why does he break this repetitive use of music in the epilogue where Tony Leung uh, is Angor, in Angor Wat? And suddenly we have this completely original piece of music that is still another waltz theme for the film. Uh, a kind of breaking with the film style instead of all this claustrophobia that's already been discussed tonight. Um, I think Gina in particular was talking about the film just opens up incredibly. You've got these massive tracking shots and bright sunlight and all of this. So all of these are things that uh, are just uh, make the film something incredibly alive for 
film, certainly in my experience, for film students today. And there's also the fact that the music is part of his cosmopolitanism, right? And one of the reasons why Juan Carmoy as a filmmaker travels so well, to get back to Ken's question, you know, Ken's interest in, in Juan Carmoy, right? And, and Juan has been very explicit and open about how much he uses music as an inspiration. So again, going back to the way that he doesn't much, frequently have much of a storyline or that, you know, that he doesn't have much of a plot. Like he, he frequently works, writes from music or brings music to the, to the, you know, to the set and asks the actors to just improvise on site on, you know, at the moment based on the song that he was interested in last night or something. I mean, that's, that's very well documented, but, you know, and, and Wong, again, as Gina was saying, like, growing up as a Shanghai emigre in Hong Kong, his mother was very cosmopolitan. He talks about that as well, that, that he was, Wong was getting a lot of global influences. And so his films, at the same time, they're so, so often, so very self-consciously set in Hong Kong and often in very particular neighborhoods in Hong Kong, right? There's always a sense that like, um, at, uh, people were saying earlier that everybody's escaping wanting to go somewhere else and and their inclination their california dreaming is that they're aware of the you know they're aware of the world and they're receptive to the world and you know again wong kar wai is interesting because in some ways he was discovered globally at the same time he was discovered locally or even even more so because he had this huge success with as tears go by then days of being wild locally was a flop you know but already he was starting to get global attention you know, through the international film circuit. And so there was, and you know, and remember his commercial production in Hong Kong is financed differently than most Hong Kong films. And, you know, um, he, he gets a lot of his financing from, from globally as well. And so there's always a sort of awareness in his films that the, he can make these kinds of films because he's always making them for a larger audience than just Hong Kong. And yet at the same time, when he attempts to break out of Hong Kong and make an American film with my blueberry nice. The struggle to actually uh, ma retain that maintain that vision is uh, it, I mean, he's yeah. struggling to actually uh, unify things uh, and to stay focused. So he's international if he stays in Hong Kong. If he leaves Hong Kong, then the vision, this international vision, you might say, seems to shrink a bit. Right. right. Yeah. It's also interesting, I think, in relation to all of this, that he's become so much less prolific in recent years. And there might be something, but the films, one of the things I think we're talking about today, why young people still respond to those films so powerfully, they're films about young people. And there's something yeah. about very youthful about the sensibility. It's a romantic sensibility, but it's a very youthful romantic sensibility. And as he himself is now in his 60s, you know, what's, what's the next step for him? Should he still keep making films about 20 and 30 year olds or should he move into this thing he calls maturity, which in the mood for love was supposed to be initiating. And you see it a bit in Grand Master, this idea of somehow addressing this thing we call maturity. Um, but it, he may f there may be a bit of a struggle there to sort of mature, shall we say, I'll put that word in quotation marks as an artist, uh, but also retain something of that romantic style tied to youth. Um, I mean, it's very interesting to contrast and compare him with a Taiwanese film like Ho Shao Shen, who often made films about very young people. But there seems to be always in Ho, even in the earlier film, kind of detachment, uh, so much less immersive uh, in terms of trying to capture that world of the of the romantic young. Especially interesting because Ho uses some of the same actors Wong does. Um, but I don't. I sense more of a detachment on Ho's part, which also allows Ho to move into other kinds of films and to make films about other kinds of histories and other kinds of, for example, there's very little family in Wong. Wong is, families are often here somewhere else. Uh, days of being wild, struggle to find the biological mother, the adoptive mother, and so on. Uh, fathers are often happy together. It's about the search for a biological father or the symbolic father and so on. Um, but families are often marginalized in these films, whereas in Ho, for example, they're often quite central. That's really interesting. Yeah, these films are really about young love, aren't they? And, yeah. and it, about characters who are, have well, maybe I'm, this is probably obviously over generalization, but um, characters who've just left kind of home in some ways. They're kind of at that stage in their life, let's say, where they're kind of make, trying to make it on their own. Um, and there's oftentimes reference to their kind of 
maybe financial dependence upon a, a parent back in Hong Kong or whatever. Um, but but no, um, but you're right. They don't they don't kind of figure in the films. You don't you don't see the parent in in um, Days of Being Wild. The biological mom. There's that moment where. I think you know he 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 doesn't get to see her, and so he turns his back so she can't see him either. And so there's a kind of a hiding from yeah. the from the parent and a breaking away from the the parental kind of nuclear family. I'm sorry. I think maybe Gina was, or or yeah. Carlos. Someone was. I, I was going to say something about the uh, Wong Kar Wai's career and relationship to mainland China, because a lot of this is kind of allegorizing Hong Kong's return to China. And through this kind of parent-child relationship that you all have been talking about, but also the changes in his career, with the importance of the mainland market, and the ways in which that he's moved away from some of his more cosmopolitan themes and from working in the U.S., which clearly did not work out with my Blueberry Nights, and working instead in mainland China, returning to Shanghai actually to do more commercial work. I mean, he does commercials. He does a lot of this. He just did a New Year uh, short, which is a Mercedes-Benz ad, actually. So, you know, these kinds of things that he's doing this kind of return to uh, what he had been, what his characters have been running away from, and that was mainland China. Interesting. When you said the the China market, you mean the market, like the, the film industry in China and marketing yeah. for the Chinese audience? Grandmaster is a very good example of that where it's a film uh, about Yip Man. Yip Man was, uh, you know, getting to be kind of a hot commodity uh, with several other filmmakers making movies about Yip Man, who of course is Bruce Lee's teacher. Uh, and it was, you know, he, he, he made it clearly with, not with Khan in mind. When he made In the Mood for Love, he had Khan in mind. That's why they go to Cambodia. It's a former French colony. There's Charles de Gaulle in the film at the end yeah. of the film. You know, there's the sense of he's looking at the world audience and he knows specifically where the film's going to premiere, Khan. And he's looking at that audience and nodding to that audience. It's the same with his newer films like Grandmaster, where he's nodding to the mainland audience. You know, he doesn't want to turn his back completely on the world uh, audience that he's so carefully cultivated through his film festival ties and through uh, working with, you know, concerns like Criterion, et cetera. But clearly his money he sees the money to be made in his future career in the mainland and it's it's not always in in motion pictures it's in other yeah. other interests let me put it that way what one has to add that that's that although i i think maybe his case is um uh, more straightforward it, it's maybe true of the film industry in general that uh oh. you know today uh, in terms of at least big hollywood blockbusters well what's the china you know is this going to appeal to a chinese audience it's a question that um, major, you know, motion picture producers ask, I guess, today more frequently than they did probably uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, you know, I had a question. We, one of the events that DeFi did a little while ago was on the films of, of Hong Sang So, the South Korean director. And I was kind of surprised to, to learn. I wouldn't, you know, in some sense, I wouldn't have guessed that uh, Wong um, shows up with such a, a, a kind of a loose script uh, because I, although his his the narrative structure of his films is rather amorphous, there is nonetheless a kind of I, I don't want to call it a resolution, but it, they they feel a bit more um, uh, slightly more uh, unidirectional than than uh, Hong Sang So's, which are really I don't know if you guys are familiar with his films. I'm sure you're probably more familiar with them than I am, but which are really kind of strange and don't seem to often go anywhere. Um, but uh, but what I was wondering is how you know with with Wong Kar Wai oftentimes his films introduce a character who becomes the central character halfway through the film or the you know in in Chunking Express you have you basically have two two stories and they intersect they overlap uh, there's that kind of contingency they kind of they 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 kind of braze one another but they don't really lock uh, into one another. How does how does he know if he doesn't if he doesn't have a, a, a you know a, a script kind of worked out in advance when to tell the actors to show up or who to cast for these <laughs> films for that matter you know it's like oh no you're not going to be on set for another month you know or I'm just curious if anyone has any insight in, into the actual production of these films in terms of you know um, how how he's managing that on the ground 
I, I think some of the actors, because he tends to work with the same actors over and over again, and they are used to this by now. And they think they know, if they see a, a three-month schedule, they know it'll mo most likely they set aside nine months in the calendar because it will take a long time. Uh, I mean, Maggie Chung has said th that all of this time, we've been tossing time a lot tonight, is worth it because she says, uh, the films I made with I make with Wong will last. They will be, the other things I do, the commercial things I do will be forgotten. These things, people, these films I make with them, people will remember and they will last. Uh, so it's worth this time that she and the other actors put into them. Wong himself has said that what happens is he starts with a clear idea and he starts with the screenplay, but he gets to the set, he sees what the actors are doing, mm -hmm. and then he starts to change in relation to that. And so things just go off in these other directions and then again when he cuts and another kind of film emerges i mean this is not an unusual approach in the history of cinema it's not unprecedented i should put it that way um but it's unusual perhaps for a lot of contempt for certain contemporary filmmakers and also i'm thinking in terms of the changing ways in which this thing we call the cinema is i mean how cinema itself is changing i don't know how wong's methods would work in things like television now how would he create a serialized tv show which is so geared towards the script preceding everything and the rig the structure of the screenplay being rigorously thought out and the st and when you get to the set it's you basically just to bring that screenplay to life it seems to be ant completely antithetical the way he works he works like a filmmaker he doesn't work like someone on a tv oh. um so i mean this may also be tied i mean all these other issues like that gina also discussed in terms of the shift in terms of from hong kong to the mainland and all of these uh, uh avenues of uh of financing and production shifting as well but also uh just the cinema itself the production methods of cinema are becoming more and more different and more diffuse and i just think he's going to struggle to actually work within that uh within that kind of climate well you know um he actually has a tv project right so he was working with um, amazon he had and it was it was supposed to be in the u.s it was shooting in san francisco when it was on the yeah. triad and so that got that was green lighted then it was put on the back burner and you know you know and the way things work in hollywood and in the media in general right like no, nobody ever says it's completely dead but re remember wong started as a screenwriter before he was directing and he started right. out in the you know doing commercial projects and so he's you know and and, and i think like one of it, the way his working method i think is surprising particularly from the vert from Hollywood, from the studio system, right? Where everything, where you have a million, a million producers watching over everything and, and, and things have to be tightly budgeted. But, you know, Hong Kong cinema from the eighties through the early nineties, when, when Wong started his career and when he does As Tears Go By and um, As Days of Being Wild and Chunking Express, like, you know, the, all of those actors were accustomed to working on multiple projects a day because that was the nature of Hong Kong film production. You know, so as as Joe says, like they're very, um, you know, it's I, you know, all, most of the actors are, you know, say that you know Maggie Chung also says that she hates working with him, but she loves the outcome. Right. You know, <laughs> so like you know, she blamed it, the end of one of her marriages to to yeah, you know, so like, on the fact that she was you know, making it's a, it's a, I, you know, there's a way in which like. You know, and I mean, as Joyce also says, like there's, you know, there's other other directors who 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 tend to do a lot in post production as well, who who are more improvisational rather than storyboarded or something. Like all directors fall, you know, somewhere along that continuum. But I think the other thing to think about is also that a place like Hong Kong in the 80s and the 90s could serve that kind of vision as well, right? And so, you know, Joe's right, like it, it's challenging to think about. I think he's he's dealing with these transitions, right? But I don't think he's, he's giving up, right? Because he he's interested in the television serial. And I think he was actually playing with doing it, like releasing it purely, um, you know, on his own streaming as well, like if it wasn't, wasn't gonna go through on Amazon. So, you know, I mean, he's young enough also to see that there are so many other possibilities as well. I um, <clears throat> I'm wondering about uh, Wong in terms of a kind of innovator of of I don't know what you'd call it uh, cinematography or something. He has he does uh, like for example um, uh, the the Karen the image behind you if I'm not mistaken that's one of those that's one of those moments in uh, uh, um, Chunking Express, where 
there's a kind of, it's almost like slow-mo, the characters either in the foreground or the background. And then they're, they're, they're basically the people in the city street are passing. So actually this is what it is. I think, I mean, the characters of the cafe, and maybe I've got the scene wrong, maybe I'm not seeing right what you have there, but you have the characters at the cafe who are moving in slow motion, but then the people in the city are zooming by really fast, they're blurred. And I hadn't seen that done in any, in any film before. Um, and he does, a, I mean, he's just, he does, he's very experimental, it strikes me in terms of um, his use of slow-mo um, in uh, Happy Together. He, he kind of pivots amazingly seamlessly back and forth between black and white and color and in a way that you don't notice kind of, I guess that'd be like Tarantino saying that he goes, is it Tarantino? Who was it recently? Um, no, I'm sorry, Wes Anderson, who used aspect ratio differently uh, throughout the Grand Budapest Hotel, right? So, um, and you don't really, if you know, if it's done effectively, maybe you don't notice it. Um, and then there's that there's that scene even where a character is dreaming in Argentina of Hong Kong, and and then you see Hong Kong and it's upside down, and you know, I mean that, uh, and, you, and it, it looks gorgeous upside down, you know. Um, I'm just wondering if if he if he's if you know among film scholars of which I am not one, um, if he is uh, widely regarded as a as a real innovator in that. I mean, I think he's uh, regarded as an innovator in terms of his narrative style, um, but I'm curious if he's also thought uh, to be similarly innovative when it comes to his uh, filming techniques if that's kind of something that's generally attributed to him. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great point you mentioned. And I think I, you can even see other things going on that may not be as obvious or as flashy that I find be quite experimental, but you have to notice them. Like I just worked on a video essay about Juan Kawai. It'll come out in a, in a few weeks, but I didn't get a chance to talk about this aspect of his cinematography, which is the way he avoids two shots two people in a space, sharing that space, looking at each other. He won't do that, especially when you get to In the Mood for Love and beyond. There's a fragmentation of that space. And it, it's, almost, it's almost like some kind of strange, uh, something, something that's a fixation, something you almost wonder, like, what is the point of this? Because it'll be so deliberate, you won't have the two shot. You'll have one person and then cut to the other, if they are in the same shot, usually one is in a mirrored reflection, or you'll have one with turned away from the other one, then they can be together, right? They can be in the same shot if one has their back turned to the other. And when you see this pattern over and over again, you realize this is, you wonder as an experiment, what is the point? But it's definitely the effect is one of fragmenting space to where characters who are together are separated. And it's done through cinematography, not through, not through editing so much. So, so yeah, in ways that are subtle and in ways that are very flashy, like the step printing and the, what I call the slow, fast motion shots, like in Chunking Express. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just chime in too with uh, Christopher Doyle? Because Wakar Wai is a very collaborative worker. As you know, we were just talking about his collaborations with the actors and actresses are very well known, but also with Christopher Doyle over much of his career. And I think that when you look at that vision, it's the two of them together coming up with that vision. Because Christopher Doyle obviously is a photographer uh, who worked with many other filmmakers, has his own style as a director himself, and who has this kind of vision that merges with Wong Wai's vision in many ways, particularly in something like Chunking Express, where they work so closely together or happy together where you really see them working together. In the Mood for Love, obviously, he didn't do as much because there were two cinematographers, uh, but still he did a lot in terms of the uh, color grading. And so when you look at, uh, look at the layers of visual layers in his films, you have to realize, okay, this is a meeting of minds. This is a tension here. It's not simply a, a unitary uh, vision of the way this world should be, but rather a world that is itself fragmented, fragmented visions, right? And that the characters themselves are alienated and that Christopher Doyle has a vision and Walker Y has a vision and then the two come together and often they, they, they collide. They're not simply one thing. Yeah, I was going to say that um, I think I wonder, I wonder if the question is, is not so much like whether how visionary would we call Wong Kar Wai a visionary or call his films visionary, because I think everyone agrees with that, right? Um, and the question might, might more be, particularly for this group of film scholars, like, you know, 
how do we gauge Juan Carwai as an OTR, given the fact that we know his work to be so dependent upon this collaboration with Christopher Doyle, William Chang Suk Ping, and his film editors mm -hmm. as well, and with the actors, right? Because at the same time, you couldn't have this completely innovative, like sensually, sensor, sensory innovation without all of the decisions that the cinematographer, the lensman, the art man, and the editor and the actors are making, and just contingency as, as well, right? Um, but then um, at the same time, so at the same time, uh, there has to be some sort of unifying vision, right, in the cutting room, right, to pull everything together. So it's simultaneously both, that innovation is simultaneously indebted to the collaboration, but also a product of the OTR. Has anyone here done no. any research on Christopher Doyle's work outside of Wong Kar Wai's? Yeah, but. Yeah, but actually, because he's worked with, I, I work a lot on women filmmakers, uh -huh. and he's worked with uh, Flora Lau and some other women filmmakers, mm -hmm. so that, you yeah. See you see continuities you, across, visually, across the films then? I think that he tries to, uh, there's some, particularly in color and in terms of perspective, but I think that the kind of step printing and all of this kind of flashier style is something that is characteristic of his work more with Walker Wai than with the, some of the other filmmakers. Right. So yeah, you see you see that there. I also think that maybe, you know, Karen mentioned earlier, Patrick Tam. So who's in the cutting room too with Walker Wai might <laughs> make a difference too in terms of the collaboration. Right, right. Um, if I were a filmmaker and I had Christopher Doyle shooting my film, I would be anxious that it's not going to look too much like a Wong Kar Wai film, if you know what I mean. I would just it's like, yeah, yeah. what else have you got there that you can give me besides what I've already seen in Chunking Express and these other films? I would love to look like a Wong Kar Wai film. Like that we all would. Yeah. We'd like to look like the actors in a Wong. I want that lighting. I want those costumes. You can position see, me in a frame. <laughs> I even went to Angkor Wat and I could not replicate <laughs> any of it in the photos of myself. And that Perfect <laughs> hair, you know, just amazing. Yes, from the front and back and the side and everything. I mean, that's the interesting thing about the title of this um, series, right? The World of Warren Car Wai, because one way of reading the title is, um, you know, underscoring this this auteur vision of Wang Car Wai and the world that he creates and um, the 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 role that he plays, the singular role that he plays in, in sort of shaping all of his works. But the other way of reading would be the world of Wang Kar Wai, the world in which he's positioned, right? These these um, these extensive collaborative relationships um, that we've, we've just been discussing, right? With the actors, with um, uh, his cinematographers, um, particularly Christopher Doyle, um, with um, other editors, scriptwriters, et cetera, et cetera. And that uh, this is really kind of a, a collaborative um, production and he's sort of a placeholder. I mean, obviously a very important placeholder, but that um, um, but that, that this is sort of a shorthand for this, you know, these, these, uh, these, these, these broadly horizontal um, um, sort of pr productive um, gestures. Yeah, I don't, what do you call the person on the set who controls like the hose and, and makes it rain because what you know I, I know I'm being silly but he's created an entire industry for such a person right <laughs> he's a lot of those people employed um, you know, sorry stupid joke uh, uh, Thorsten you haven't jumped in yet do you have uh, any uh, comments or burning questions or uh, remarks for us well, it was just uh, striking me that um, when we say he creates his world that is probably the reason why uh, he is still popular um, because you don't have to relate it to another world. You don't relate that film to uh, your contemporary world. And it's not just a film coming from the past, but it creates uh, its own time. So it's not just the, the, the space. Uh, and I think th th that is the secret uh, um, well, because we were wondering uh, why, uh, how can people still relate to it? It's because they don't relate it to themselves but they see it as a, as a capsule, as a, as a time capsule, as something that is self-reflexive. Yeah, I, you know, a lot of his movies, at least it, it, it seems to me difficult sometimes to place them, uh, you know, temporally, historically. Is this taking place in, uh, just right. for example, um, uh, Happy Together, the first, the first uh, it wasn't until the, men I don't think he mentions 1997, the death of Chairman, 
sorry, my Chinese history is really awful. Um, but he doesn't, you know, it's not until then that I realize, oh, this is taking place in the 90s. I thought maybe this was in the 90s or something. Um, and it, but it's it's not that it felt specifically pinned to the mid 70s, but it has a kind of strange timeless, and this might connect back, Thorsten, to your comment about the kind of nostalgia, not the nostalgia that the characters have, uh, but the nostalgia that that the viewer experiences. Uh, it's its kind of a nostalgia for a world that never existed for, for myself, for example, but I still feel it as this kind of part, a past that I wish I shared. Um, yeah, who's, who's listening to Happy Together in 1997, right? <laughs> that kind of music, right? That displaces it. And it, it, but there are references in all of his films to specific time periods. Uh, and it's definitely 1997. It's definitely the death of Doug Xiaoping that's reported on the radio. Mm -hmm. It's definitely the handover that they're talking about. And when you see the passports and people are saying, well, what's left out of the film? Given that the uh, British National Overseas Passport here at Hong Kong has become so controversial recently, I'm wondering if maybe the passports that you see in the film that were at that stage also being contested in terms of nationality, if that might be, uh, you know, cut out. Hopefully he's left in upside down Hong Kong because we still feel upside down very often here in Hong Kong. Oh, I, you mean in the recent, <laughs> that's right. In the you, recent cut of you, Happy Together. I, I didn't, I didn't see it yet. Yeah, the passports are still in. Uh, and, oh, good, and, good, uh, good, good, good. In Hong Kong, I'm happy to report. <laughs> that is, that is the, definitely. Right. There is a way in which, uh, some of the films will, for an extended period of time, be not terribly specific about the time period. I think In the Mood for Love, for example, for much of its running time, I think it's quite purposely meant to not be a specific year, but just to encapsulate a number of years uh, in the life of Hong Kong. And then when you get to all those final sequences, the then it's very specific about year and historical key historical moments and so on. So always this sense of the, the fantasy, the possibility of just being enveloped in some historical moment for as long as you can possibly sustain it. And then finally, historical reality breaks in and disrupts the fantasy. Good, good. Okay, well, quick question from Keith, actually, who's just, uh, he wasn't able to get back in, so he's gonna, he texted it to me. Uh, as film scholars, programmers, and educators, we know and can speak on great film, which Wong Kar Wai, as an auteur, is a creator of. But I think that part of what makes his films great is that we all have one of his films that we all actually love for personal reasons. I'm curious what each uh, person's uh, loved film is and one reason why. So we're gonna do kind of a quick, this is kind of a nice way, we've got exactly five minutes. So we'll do kind of a, a quick round, uh, we'll, 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 everybody can kind of answer that. So what's your, is there one particular film in his uh, oeuvre that you just, you absolutely love for personal reasons and, and why? Uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> Obviously, Chunking Express, and the reason why this is it, 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 this is a story for you, Ken. It's because that's when I learned to watch movies by seeing them through the eyes of the students. Because I had seen Chunking Express the first time on video, getting ready to TA a course on Hong Kong cinema, and I totally didn't get it because I'd watched it by myself. And then when I had to screen it for all of like the undergraduates, they were laughing, and you know they totally got it. Like they got everything about it, and it made me see the film with new eyes. And um, and it, so that sort of moment of discovery will always be there for me with that film. Well, I'll piggyback on that. Yes, of course, Chunking Express is the one. Although Happy Together, I have to say, Tony Leung's performance in that movie. Uh, I have, it's just a rare connection between audience and character, I think. That's what Tony Leung brings to that role. And I find myself completely immersed in that, in that role, in that character, because of that performance. But Chunking Express is probably overall, like, the, the favorite. Gina? Oh, well, yeah, I, it's very, it's tough. Uh, but I have to go with Chunky Express as well. And it's for something that you said, Adam, and that's those toys. You know, the minute Bridget Lynn stands in front of that toy store, I'm just, I was just hooked. I'd loved also before, I'd of course seen uh, Days of Big Wild before that. And the weaving through, I mean, something we just didn't talk about today, the weaving through of Tony Leung through all these films, it's something Ken has just touched on. 
is just amazing. I mean, his performances in all these films, even with that brief appearance at the end, that provocative ending to uh, Days of Big Wild is something that, you know, can, just hooks you right away. So it's tough to pick. Joe, the, on my screen, you I, I, yeah, I hate these kinds of questions. <laughs> uh, I'm not really one to pick one film. If I had to pick, it would probably be a tie between The Hand and 2046, both the, the epic and the very intimate film. Also, I, Tony Lung, I like seeing across, I mean, I like seeing Tony Lung age, so, but that's 2046 may be the most interesting Tony Lung film for me. Let's see. Oh, yeah. shoot. Um, I mean, I think Fallen Angels was the first one car wife film that I saw. And then coincidentally, I saw it decades ago when I was still a grad student and was actually applying to, um, for a position at, at um, Ingenious Department um, way back when. Um, and so I was sort of like thinking through my mind, Hong Kong through the lens of Fallen Angels, which was a kind of kind of interesting experience. So um, speaking of nostalgia, that's never left me. Um, but then again, you know, like Joe, I can't pick one. Um, Happy Together, weirdly enough, um, was uh, we, we used the tango um, music from Happy Together for our our our, our wedding, um, and and so that's always had like a, a special place in my in my heart. Nice, Thorsten. Well, I guess it's me. So I I I, I cannot pick one. I would have to think about it. But um, certainly, um, that's what I was talking about. Uh, these first six minutes of days of, of being wild is. Um, for me, it's so haunting and um, uncanny. I was fascinated. I, I, I watched it many times. I showed it to other people. I said, just come look at these six minutes. This is now the best six minutes uh, of, of Chinese cinema that I've ever seen. And there, there, is, there is something in there. So that's, that's certainly the thing that I would put forward. <clears throat> Well, I guess I get to answer too. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna have I have that generic answer that that no one's gonna like Chungking Express as well. <laughs> but partly that's because my my first time and I, I lived off and on in India for a while. I did a degree in South Asian oh. studies, and and my first trip I uh, I stopped. I was I don't know 17 or something traveling alone, and I, I had a layover in Hong Kong, and that was my first. And and I and so when I there's something about that film that cap that captures my love for that city i mean i don't know the escalators the kind of the the kind of cosmopolitan nature the the first you know five or ten minute uh kind of uh story involving where, where you have that kind of subculture of south asians living in, in hong kong and you have the the bollywood or bhangra music that's that's played throughout those scenes um i just for me it's just like a window into a world that i want to escape to uh, especially now uh during uh covid but um, I, I think I know why Keith asked the question because Keith has a really good, <laughs> he has a really nice story to tell about this. Uh, Keith, are you with us? Are you able to unmute? I am. Can you all hear me? Good. Yeah, we can hear. <laughs> coming in, coming in as the voice of God. No, yeah. uh, I'm Keith Garcia, artistic director of the Sea Film Center. Uh, programmed this retrospective for Denver Film. Uh, and Adam and I were talking about special stuff with Wong Kar Wai, and I brought up that. My introduction to Wong Kar Wai was through Chungking Express, uh, through the Quentin Tarantino VHS release, and that there's many reasons why that struck with me at that time. And I was very young when, uh, when I first watched this movie. I was probably 20, 21 maybe. Um, so obviously I identified with a bit of it. But um, Tony Lung's uh, personification of all the items in his apartment uh, I found very incredibly precious. And in the subtitles of the VHS release, he's describing the washcloth and how it's always dripping. And he talks about it being sensitive. And he says, it's always been, the subtitle in the VHS release reads, it's always been a very emotionally charged towel. And that phrase in those subtitles rang so true to me and like I self-identified as an emotionally charged towel like I thought that was the most perfect 
words put together um, and adopted that to a blog that I wrote later on and other such things. Uh, I was very disappointed in the Criterion Blu-ray release of Chung King that came out a couple of years ago because they changed the subtitle to not be emotionally charged towel, but to instead be something like that towel has always been very sensitive. Oh. And uh, my heart broke, but <laughs> <laughs> I was also able to sort of pull back to be like, you know what? My like super appreciation and love to focus on the further films and past films of Wong Kar Wai came from that simple phrasing, whether it's correct or not. Uh, and it's if that's trapped in the VHS tape of Chunky Express, I'll take it for myself to be like well, The that. subtitle, Keith, on the uh, Criterion Channel upload of Chunking Express says it's still, it's a very emotional tell. Not emotionally charged, just an emotional. Yeah, see, tell. still, that one word changes everything. Charged is still, I know, a much stronger way of phrasing it. <laughs> I know there are at least there are at least a, a bunch of you on this panel that probably that that would would know the the you know the, the the actual expression and whether you know sometimes you know fidelity in translation is not what's important you want to capture the spirit you know so um, well thank you guys we've pretty much run out of time but I really appreciate all of you guys being here uh, tonight and or this morning <laughs> depending on look we've got we we watched the sunrise in Kuwait I mean that's that, beautiful that's look at that. Special. Uh, that's really special. Thorsten, you might have to talk to get back on the screen so everybody can hear you, but um, but we do have a sunrise in Kuwait, and we have Gina in Hong Kong, and and uh, the rest of you kind of scattered around, uh, around the states. Really, really uh, grateful for your expertise, your insight. Um, it's, it's, it's inspired me to go back and watch a lot of these uh, movies, so, uh, and I'm sure you'll be, it'll be inspiring others, too. So thank you all. And I'll be in touch with each one of you afterwards. But thank you so much. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good seeing you, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Bye-bye.